Rage and tears abound as Roe is overturned. Democrats try to jazz up their 2022 base but have no actual plan. And we examine which party is truly extreme on abortion. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. I talk about them every single show. Why haven't you gotten a VPN yet? Get ExpressVPN right now at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Speaking of which, you know, there are a lot of people out there who want your data. I'm talking big tech, big government. They all want your data either to monetize or to monitor. And the simple fact is you should not give them that data. Your data is your own. And this is why you should have ExpressVPN the way that I do. One of the easiest ways for brokers to aggregate data and tie it back to you is through your device's unique IP address, which also reveals information about your location. When you're connected to ExpressVPN, however, your IP address is hidden. It makes it much more difficult for data brokers to identify who you are. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of network traffic to keep your data safe from hackers on public Wi-Fi, which is why I have the ExpressVPN app downloaded on all my devices. I'm talking phone, computer, even my home Wi-Fi router. All I do is tap one button to activate it, and now I'm protected. It's that simple. And by the way, that, that's the whole thing. You hit one button, you download it, you hit another button, it's activated, you're good to go. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben right now. Get three extra months free through my special link. Make sure your online activity and data is protected with the best VPN money can buy. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash Ben. Expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. That's expressvpn.com slash Ben. Protect your internet data the way that I do. Expressvpn.com slash Ben. So obviously on Friday, the Supreme Court drops A historic decision, the biggest decision that it's made in nigh on 50 years, basically saying that Roe versus Wade is now overturned and the issue of abortion returns to the state level where a wide variety of states will now actually attempt a wide variety of legislative solutions on the question of when life ought to be protected in the womb. Now, again, prior to Roe, this was the status of all law in the United States. You had different laws in California than you had in Alabama. But Roe stopped that conversation with a bunch of justices arrogating to themselves the power to determine what standards should be set nationally on abortion. They did it without any pretext in the Constitution. They didn't even bother to try and really make an argument as to why the Constitution mandated that the Supreme Court arrogate that power to itself. In Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court backed away from the standards set up in Roe a little bit, but again, suggested that the court was going to end national controversy by somehow magically arrogating to itself power that it did not have under the Constitution of the United States. And finally, the Supreme Court, after 50 years, did the right thing and reversed Roe v. Wade 6-3. Now, really, it was 5-4 with Justice Roberts. Kind of, It was 5-3-1 with Justice Roberts sort of in the middle, but joining in the decision to greenlight the Mississippi statute that would have banned abortion at 15 weeks and beyond, which, by the way, is extremely, extremely late. But here is the bottom line. Today, there's a lot of talk about how this is going to radically reshift the state of play in the United States politically, how this is going to turn into a hot button political issue all across the United States in federal elections, how 2022 will be decided on abortion, 2024 will be decided on abortion, 2028 will be decided on abortion. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. And the reason that that is wrong is because when issues become states' issues, they stop being federal issues. And this is indubitably going to be a state issue. This happens to be true whether you are pro-life or whether you are pro-choice. You're hearing pro-choicers today saying things about how they would like to, for example, enshrine Roe versus Wade into, into law via Congress. They do not have the power to do this. They do not. And they tried to push something a little bit earlier this year. They tried to push a measure earlier this year that was called the Women's Health Protection Act. It was unconstitutional because it turns out that Congress does not actually have the power to regulate criminal activity within states. They have to have some sort of connection to federal policy. You've seen the Congress try to end around this in certain ways. Like they'll say that if it affects interstate commerce, then you can't perform this sort of abortion or you can perform this sort of abortion. The Supreme Court is likely to strike those sorts of laws down. This also happens to be true for pro-lifers. So if pro-lifers say we want a congressional piece of legislation that bars abortion after week six, for example, in the United States, broadly speaking, there is a very good shot the Supreme Court led by conservatives, says that there is no constitutional basis to do this because, again, the Congress of the United States is meant to legislate on a federal level. State legislatures are meant to legislate on a state level, which means that the only federal solution to the abortion issue would theoretically be a constitutional amendment, which requires an enormous amount of buy-in, not only in Congress, but also in three-fifths of the states. So you would have to have an actual constitutional amendment. The pro-choicers don't have the power to do that. The pro-lifers right now don't have the power to do that, which means that practically speaking, this is going to break down very quickly into a state's issue. Alabama already has its own law. New York is going to allow abortion until you actually die of old age. It's going to turn into abortion Disneyland over in California. And meanwhile, in Mississippi, it's going to be like you can't get one. And that is how policy is done in the United States of America. If you think that that is going to motivate votes for Democrats, The Democrats deeply in California and New York, they're going to be deeply exercised about the abortion issue 
in Mississippi, you got another thing coming. And the reason I know this is the case is because in May of 2021, Texas passed a law. That law effectively ended abortion in the state of Texas. This has been true for over a year in the state of Texas. And up until five minutes ago, no one thought that this was going to affect the 2022 election. It's not even affecting Beto O'Rourke in the Texas gubernatorial election. Okay, so the reality is that what's now going to happen is that localities are going to decide this very differently. The people who are most passionate about this on both sides are already in their respective states. You're not getting a bunch of passionate pro-lifers in New York and California deciding policy. You're not getting a bunch of passionate pro-choicers in Mississippi deciding policy. And in the purple states, the abortion policy is probably going to end up somewhere in the middle. Florida's abortion law is probably not going to look like Mississippi's abortion law. Neither is Indiana's. Right? States that are somewhere in the middle are going to end up with legislation that looks somewhere in the middle, which means that, believe it or not, right now the temperature is super high because whenever there is a shift in the status quo ante, what this means is that everybody panics and everybody freaks out. But the way this is going to boil down practically and politically is that it's going to settle down into a state law issue. And then like every other state law issue, it won't be a federal issue. And people are going to yell about it at the national level, but it really is not going to make an enormous difference in terms of our elections going forward. One of the reasons you're seeing outsized outrage from Democrats today, they know this, by the way, everybody knows this. Everybody who has an ounce of legal acumen understands that what I'm saying is true. That congressional legislation, either pro-life or pro-choice, is going to be extremely limited in what it can do here. And that means that the battles are all going to be had at the state legislative level. And it also means that the people who are most animated about this are already polarized in their various states. Red state people are mostly in the red states. Blue state people are mostly in the blue states. The biggest impact of this is probably going to be a continued polarization between red and blue. People are going to vote with their feet. You're going to see more liberal people stay in New York and Connecticut and New Jersey and Massachusetts. And you're going to see more conservative people stay in places in the South or move from North to South. And you're going to see people who are pro-choice in the South move to the North or move to the move to California. Like that continuing polarization is going to maintain. But the reason that the left is, is fighting mad is they want to win 2022 based on this. This is one of the things that they are hoping. They're hoping this is going to reanimate their extraordinarily moribund political hopes for 2022 and 2024 since the president is not alive anymore and his policies have been counterproductive on literally every issue. So don't be deceived by the amount of heat and light that's being generated right now. Within three weeks, I promise you, within three weeks, a lot of this is going to have died down. Within six months, it certainly is going to have died down because again, Everybody who wants an abortion in New York State is going to be able to get an abortion. Everybody who wants one in California is going to be able to get one. Now, as a pro-lifer, does that make me happy? No, it doesn't, because I think that human rights violations are human rights violations. I think that the murder of children in the womb at eight months or nine months, which is exactly what they're doing in places like California and New York legally, I think that that is, in, in, forget about 100 years from now, I think today, people are going to look back at that and they're going to say that this is a barbarity, a, a moral atrocity. So I'm unhappy with that, but that is also the state of play and that's the way it's going to be. So the notion that people are going to get wildly animated, go to the polls in 2022, throw the bums out and give Democrats a majority. Mm, no, and as we'll see, Democrats are struggling for an actual strategy to deal with the fact that now people in the various states are going to actually get to vote on these issues. Well, we begin today with exactly the, the outrage that you would expect from the left. The left is completely outraged about this. We are talking screaming to the heavens we are, or below. We're talking about people who are just freaking out, losing their minds. One of the videos going around me, this, this I think encapsulates the, um, the response of much of the left, which is just a rage cry of horror at the simple fact that this issue has now been returned to the states because nobody, if, if you, the, the amount of ignorance and lies that are being purveyed by the left on this particular issue, truly insane. One, they keep saying that the Supreme Court just outlawed abortion. The Supreme Court did not outlaw abortion. The Supreme Court delegated it back to the states. The Supreme Court clearly cannot outlaw abortion doesn't have the power to outlaw abortion. So that's number one. You're seeing the left just tell sheer lies. You'll, you'll see a meme going around about how these states are going to bar people from, from having removals of ectopic pregnancies or, or if you've had a miscarriage and you have to have some sort of procedure to get the, the miscarried fetus removed from the uterus. This is going to count as an abortion. There's not a single state. Show me the legislative language that does this. It does not exist. So the left is just lying about this because they have to lie about this because again, the truth is, that once you start talking about the moral abomination that is abortion, your arguments start to look a lot, a lot less popular. The fact they even have to have these arguments is what's making this the, the left so angry today. They don't want to have these arguments because it turns out, as we'll talk about in a second, the people who are truly extreme on this issue, like truly, truly morally extreme on this issue, are members of the left. So instead, it's rage cries to heaven. So here is one TikTok liberal, I think, encapsulating the entire reaction of the media, Democratic Party, and corporate America today. Ah! 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 
Um, I think this person should be making all policy in the United States, probably. Probably that's a good idea. Speaking of, of our greatest policymakers, you have celebrity class coming out and being very upset. So Olivia Rodrigo, who I will admit I had not heard of until the last five minutes because I'm not a teeny bopper. Um, Olivia Rodrigo was with another person named Lily Allen. And uh, I will admit that I had not heard of, of Lily Allen either. In fact, I was mixing her up with Lily Tomlin when I was looking this up. But apparently they are both people who uh, dress like 17-year-old teeny boppers and prance around while breathing heavily into microphones, recording songs that do not have capital letters in them. If you look at Olivia Rodrigo's song list, they, apparently she's like E.E. E. Cummings. All capital letters are forbidden. It's like favorite crime, no capital F, no favorite C. Good for you. No capital G. U is spelled letter U and four is the number four. So you know, clear, brilliant expositors on the state of American law and the existential issue of when human life begins. Olivia Rodrigo and Lily Allen, they go to a concert where they... um where they prance around in two pieces and talk about how abortion is really, 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 really important. And also F those justices, F them. Yes, we have great thinkers like Samuel Lito on the one side and we have Olivia Rodrigo on the other. This song goes out to the justices, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch. Oh, wow, Lily Allen's flipping people off, heroism. So they're singing, the song is, is F you. Well, I mean, slow clap for the, for the heroism involved in advocating for the, um, for the killing of the unborn en masse by uh, singing in front of people for money. Just very, very, very stellar stuff. Frankly, I'm not going to lose any sleep over Olivia Rodrigo and uh, her genius co-stars like Lily Allen being very, very upset with the Supreme Court of the United States because I've never thought of them before until like this clip came into my inbox last night. But there are a lot of other reasons to lose sleep, including the fact that I have small kids. And that means that they're getting me up at like all hours of the night. This means I need a mattress that's going to be just the best because when I'm on that mattress, I had best be asleep because I ain't going to get any extra time on that mattress. That's why I use Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep made a mattress just for me. I've got a quiz. It takes two minutes to complete. It matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Everybody's unique. Helix knows that. They have several different mattress models to choose from. They've got soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Mattress is great for spinal alignment, prevent morning aches and pains, even a Helix Plus mattress for plus-size sleepers. I took the Helix quiz. I was matched with a model that is particularly firm and also quite breathable because I tend to heat up a lot at night, and that's why I sleep well. Just go to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Take that two-minute sleep quiz. They'll match you to a mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life. And here's the thing. they got a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. So what exactly are you waiting for? They'll even pick it up for you for free if you don't like it, but that's never going to happen. It just isn't. For a limited time, Helix is offering up to 350 bucks off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. That is their best offer yet. Hurry on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Some of the other moral arguments being made by the freaked out left, Anna Navarro, who uh, used to be considered a Republican. I'm not sure why. Uh, she was on The View, the repository of all human stupidity. And uh, she actually made the argument that... Um, we definitely 100% need abortion because she has Down syndrome family members, which sounds horrifically eugenic and also pretty evil. Like there's some members of my family who I'm not super fond of. I also have never made the public argument that they should probably have been killed in the womb. That seems awkward. I am not anybody to tell you what you need to do with your life or with your uterus. And because I have a family with a lot of special needs kids. I have a brother who's 57 and has the mental and motor skills of a one-year-old. And I know what that means financially, emotionally, physically for a family. And I know not all families can do it. And I have a step-granddaughter who was born with Down syndrome. And you know what? It is very difficult in Florida to get services. Yeah, that, that argument doesn't come out of your mouth, Anna, the way that you think that it does. I have a brother, and he has Down syndrome. Man, it would be easier if he were dead. Yeah, that doesn't sound quite as good, I think, out of your face as it did uh, when it was in your head. We have Martha Raddatz and ABC News lashing out at all of this. Again, the media is just a wing of the Democratic Party, which if you didn't believe me, I mean, one of, one of the leading expositors of abortion is a lady named Kate Smith. She used to be a reporter for CBS News. I mean, she's literally a, a frontline, quote unquote, objective news reporter. And now she works for a pro-abortion group because this is the media en masse. Here's Martha Raddatz at ABC News lashing out. 
On Friday morning, women in this country, like they have for nearly 50 years, woke up with a constitutional right to abortion, a right enshrined by the Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade and reaffirmed again and again. But just after 10 a.m. on Friday, a legal earthquake, the court stripping women of that fundamental right. Okay, it's not a fundamental right. That's the whole point of the case. The whole point of the case is that it is not a fundamental right. I I love I love how the the entire media, they're taking their lead. As you'll see from the Democratic Party, right, the Democratic Party is making the argument that a fundamental right existed and then it didn't exist. Okay, but by that logic, by that same exact logic, there was a fundamental right in the United States for states to segregate their their trolley cars. And then that right was stripped in Brown versus Board. That is not the way any of this works. Either it's in the Constitution or it's not in the Constitution. Abortion is not in the Constitution. It is not a fundamental right. It was never a fundamental right. You can't make a moral argument that it was a fun, like that 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 argument does not exist on a moral level and it doesn't exist on a constitutional legal level. But the idea is that that women everywhere are going to be put under the boot heel by all of this. That women everywhere have now been denied equality. This was the argument of the dissent, by the way. And I want to take just a moment to I think explicate this argument. Because it de- it really does demonstrate how for the left, abortion is a sacramental issue. It is a sacrament. It's not that abortion is something sad, rare, but legal, right? It's instead, what it is supposed to be is a sacrament. It is an active good because every abortion is a statement that females will not be put under the heel of human biology, that human biology runs counter to women's aspirations. And therefore, abortion is necessary, deeply necessary, in order to free women of the evils of the reality of human biology. This is why the, the abortion, the pro-abortion left will treat pregnancy as an impediment and childbearing and child rearing as a burden. It's why they use this sort of language. By the way, I don't think most human beings resonate to. Most people see children as a gift. They see pregnancy as an active good. But for the left, these things are active bads. And the reason that they are active bads is because the feminist movement, since particularly the 1950s and 60s, starting with Simone de Beauvoir and moving forward through Betty Friedan, has basically considered motherhood to be a bad thing. They have said that the chief obstacle to human equality is that women have had to bear children, that this is a bad thing. And if we could only obliterate the sex distinction between men and women, suddenly women would lead freer, happier, more fulfilled lives. Now, the feminist promise has been a lie. It has not been true. By every available metric, women are less happy now than they were in, say, 1970. By every available metric, we're talking self-surveys, the happiness level of American women has declined over the period since Roe became actual legal law in the United States. But it's a deeply held part of the left's fundamental belief system, which is that you are a free-floating bag of identity, and you get to define yourself any way that you want, and any impediment to that identity is therefore evil. And that impediment could be your own child growing in the womb. If that impediment is your own child growing in the womb, we need to get rid of it. This is why abortion is supremely important. You, you You can hear this. In the words of the second wave feminist, the second wave feminist made this perfectly clear. I mean, Simone de Beauvoir was arguing in 1953, quote, the female is a woman insofar as she feels herself as such. Some essential biological givens are not part of her lived situation. For example, the structure of the ovum is not reflected in it. By contrast, an organ of slight biological importance like the clitoris plays a primary role in it. Nature does not define woman. It is she who defines herself by reclaiming nature for herself in her affectivity. The only reason, according to Simone de Beauvoir, that women were actually becoming mothers and wives is because of cultural indoctrination, and that had to stop. So you can see why abortion is so wildly important to the left. It underlies the entire obliteration of the sex distinction between male and female, which is supposed to be an impediment to human happiness, according to the left. So this is why they're really, really, really angry. MSNBC's Tiffany Cross, she continued along these lines. She says that, you know, what happened here was four men and a handmaiden because Amy Coney Barrett is now a handmaiden. Good feministing here. But when I say good feministing, I think what people fail to understand is that first wave feminism would argue that it's actually quite sexist to label Amy Coney Barrett, a mother of seven and a woman who is on the Supreme Court, a handmaiden. But according to the second and third wave feminists, she is a handmaiden because she's been indoctrinated. She's like, it's the same way that the left treats a conservative black person or a conservative Jew. Anybody who is a member of a of an identified minority by the left who does not side with the left is a traitor. It's somebody who's been indoctrinated by the system and is, in fact, a handmaiden. So there's perfect sincerity when Tiffany Cross says this over at MSNBC, no matter how vile it is. Today, for the first time in 49 years, American women are waking up with less rights than we had yesterday after the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. Now, people across the country have taken to the streets protesting this move. The majority of Americans did not want the court to overturn Roe v. Wade. 
a majority of Americans. But four men who will never bear children and one handmaiden decided for an entire country that their Christian doctrine is the only way. Okay, their Christian doctrine is the only uh, No, that's not what they decided. If they decided their Christian doctrine was the only way, they would have barred abortion explicitly by encoding pro-life positions in the 14th Amendment. So clearly they didn't. In fact, nobody even made that argument. Thomas didn't even make that argument. And yet here she is just expositing these lies. By the way, there's a certain irony to her saying four, four men who couldn't bear children and a woman who's a handmaiden. There, there are two other women on the court, by the way. Neither of them have children. And Sonia Sotomayor does not have children. Elena Kagan does not have children. But apparently they have more to say about childbearing and rearing than Amy Coney Barrett, who has seven of them. So that's fascinating. Meanwhile, the CNN panel, I mean, the, the media's tears are, are in fact quite delicious. And you know what? I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I have sympathy for the media because I don't. I don't have sympathy for the media today. It is their job to cover these issues with some degree of objectivity and they are liars. So I have no sympathy for them. For all the people who are upset about this decision, who feel their fundamental rights have been stripped from them, I have some sympathy for some of these people because I think that they have been wildly misinformed. I think they've been wildly misinformed and lied to about the nature of what human happiness constitutes. But for members of the media, I have no sympathy at all because these are people who are supposed to be covering the news objectively and straight, and they are not. They are just liars. So there's a CNN panel going nuts when someone mentions the great and sainted RBG. By the way, great irony here. If RBG had retired while, while Barack Obama was president, they wouldn't have had this problem. So they, they sainted RBG, and it's RBG's decision to hold on, thinking Hillary Clinton was going to win the 2016 election that probably ended with the striking down of Roe v. Wade. So, uh, so good job on the heroing there. Here is, uh, here is CNN. As much as I would like to see a federal ban, I know that that is politically unlikely. And so that, I think, is the best compromise. And in fact, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said not that her, she... not say her I, let me quote, tonight from let me your quote mouth her. after Excuse what you just me. said. You are literally... You I'm going to let... I'm going to go to Abby. You support a 12-year-old who's been raped to have to actually carry her pregnancy to term. That is what Excuse you support. Me. You support women dying in this country if they have an atopic pregnancy because that no, is what That's a will lie. happen. That's words in my mouth. Excuse that me. is what you That support. is not okay. Okay, so it's amazing. Again, it's all about saints and about sacraments. RBG is a saint. It doesn't matter that, again, it was her bad decision making that probably led to this point, legally speaking. But sure, she's a, she's a saint. Get her name out of your mouth. I mean, they, they, they literally treat RBG and their saints as though they are, as though they are God. And, and one of the commandments is being violated. Like one of the first couple, take no gods before me and their name shall not be mentioned in vain. Right? It's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Well, if your God is not RBG or government, then one thing you're going to want to celebrate this year is July 4th, where we recognize the independence of the American people from oppressive tyranny by the government. There are a couple things you need for July 4th. You need fireworks and you need American meat. I'm talking about the best meat money can buy good ranchers. How do I know this? Because they actually got me a kosher steak and they made it for me on a grill. Let me just tell you, this thing is like one of, it may be the best steak I've ever had in my life. And it literally was just a steak that they threw on the barbecue. It is that good. They make the meat, the, like there's no way to make better meat than Good Ranchers makes it. Did you know that 85% of grass-fed beef sold in your local grocery store is imported from overseas? Stop paying premium price for low-quality foreign meat. Good Ranchers guarantees 100% American meat delivered straight to your door for a great price. Right now, they're giving away two free ribeyes, $100 value, to my listeners through July 4th. So get active right now. You heard right. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Ben. Use my code Ben. Get two 18-ounce prime center cut ribeyes free with your order. I'm hungry for that steak right now. I'm thinking about it. Now I'm hungry. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Ben. Claim your ribeyes today before they run out. Stop spending exorbitant amounts of money on low-quality meat at the grocery store. Subscribe to Good Ranchers. Said, by the way, I know the guys who run the company. Fabulous people. Go check them out right now. GoodRanchers.com slash Ben for the best meat on planet Earth before July 4th. Get that special deal. Meanwhile, you have people like the, like the NBC panel was laughing at Peggy Noonan. Peggy Noonan was suggesting on NBC that maybe we can start to have some sort of coming together around what's best for women. And of course, this is laughable because we all know what's best for women, which is for them to abort their babies en masse. You know what the Republican Party should do now? It should use this victory, if you see it that way, to change itself and become a party that helps <laughs> women it's to change its right. reputation, it. become a party that helps women and children, becomes responsible right. and supportive. Here? It's amazing. She's making an actual liberal case and they're getting angry at her. She's saying we need more child support and more government spending. And they're laughing at her because, again, they don't care about that. 
Okay, that one of the one of the arguments you hear from the left all the time is, well, if you care so much about these babies, why not more social spending? So here's the thing. I don't think social spending has been particularly effective in a wide variety of these cases. And when there's a family in need in my community, you know what we do as a community? We get together and we actually send money to the family and we help them out and bring them food and we get their kids tuition off. Like we do a lot of things in our local community to help kids who are in need. That is a thing that I think is actually effective, but they don't care about that. It's all just an excuse to kill the baby because the argument doesn't even follow. The argument that they're constantly making is, well, if you oppose abortion, why don't you spend more money on welfare? I'm, I'm confused. If I, if I don't support money for welfare, does this mean that, that I'm in favor of murdering somebody? Does this also hold true? If, if, I don't, if I don't believe that we should just hand cash to homeless people, does this mean I also think that we should stab them in the face? Like, what, what exactly is your argument here? There is no argument. But it's not about arguments. It's about emotional appeal and screaming at the sky. Here is one historian, Ruth ben Ziad, who is uh, comparing Roe being overturned to Hitler, to Hitler, which is madness considering you have the left actually advocating on behalf of eugenic abortion, which seems a lot more Hitlerian to me than saying that babies should not be killed in the womb. It doesn't matter if it's somebody who comes along like a Hitler and, and becomes popular and, you know, or somebody who gets elected or even a coup, because in Spain in the 1930s, part of the atmosphere of, of making way for a military coup was that women became like they got independence for the first time. They could own their own property. There were a lot of gender emancipation. So every time these strongmen come along, they are the agents of taking those rights away and reversing the, em reversing the emancipation of women uh, in every way. So um, it's just amazing. It's, it's, if you're in favor of maintaining the lives of the unborn, it's, it's Hitlerian. And then again, you have the, the baseline argument from people like Dahlia Lithwick, who's supposed to be some sort of a legal expert. She was interviewed for the New York Times by Ezra Klein. And uh, she says it's about raw power. What the Supreme Court did here is about raw power. No, it isn't. It was raw power when the Supreme Court seized this issue in the first place. It is not raw power when the Supreme Court turns it back to elected legislatures across the country. As soon as Amy Coney Barrett comes onto the court, and John Roberts is no longer determinative of anything. And let's be clear, his concurrence today really shows that he is now kind of constitutionally irrelevant to the majority of the court. But as soon as there stopped being any doubt about what you were going to get, the court could have done a whole bunch of things, some of which are just optics and appearances, some of which are genuine efforts to say we're going to pump the brakes. We're not going to make it look like this is an enterprise. It is about raw power. It's, it's not about raw power. It's about there were votes on the Supreme Court to actually go back to the text of the Constitution. But as I say, I've been saying it all show. I've been saying it for years. The argument on behalf of abortion is never clearly constructed because the argument on behalf of abortion is that deeper feminist argument, which is that the distinctions between men and women ought to be obliterated on behalf of equality and abortion is a key tool in that. That is the actual argument that they want to make. And this requires you, that argument requires you to forcibly ignore the evidence of your own eyes, which is that babies exist in the womb. Which brings us to the, the picture of the day. This picture, I believe, was featured in the Washington Post. It was a picture of a woman who has to be at least six months pregnant uh, by the size of her stomach, by the size of her belly. And um, pasted across her belly is, uh, is the slogan, this is not yet a human. This is not yet a person. Honestly, if you believe that, then you should actually paste that across your face because the, like, you're the person who's being inhuman here. You're the person being inhuman. But this undergirds, it undergirds everything that the left says. Right. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, for example, she came out and like and just tweeted forced pregnancy is a crime against humanity. Rape is a crime against humanity. And so is kill it's hard to think of a greater crime against humanity than killing unborn innocent children. That seems like a crime against humanity, like literally in the name crime against humanity means a crime against human beings, human beings with potential, unborn human beings. But it, it's, it's not about that. that. That interest has to be completely ignored. We have to pretend it simply doesn't exist. You have to look at the evidence of a pregnant woman and pretend that what's in that uterus is absolutely meaningless, has no countervailing interest, that all of us were not at one time inside the uterus of another human being. Right? We have to pretend all of that stuff away. And when the left is forced to confront that reality, this is why they're yelling at the sky today. This is why they're screaming, because that argument is not a winning argument. That is not a good argument. It is not a convincing argument. 
Okay, so Democrats are hoping that this is going to pay off for them, electorally speaking. There's a whole article in the Washington Post today titled Democrats Seize on Abortion Ruling in Midterms as Republicans Tread Carefully. Democrats across the country are seizing on the Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade with state and federal candidates seeking to turn anger about the decision into support at the ballot box, even as Republicans aim to keep attention on rising prices and crime less than five months before the midterms. Okay, this, of course, was led by President. Of course, they're trying to use abortion. By the way, they control the House. They control the Senate. They control the presidency. Question. They, they controlled the House, the Senate, and the presidency during some of the term of Barack Obama as well. And they controlled the Supreme Court for virtually all of my lifetime. So uh, I have a question. Why is it that during that time you didn't use your electoral branches, not the Supreme Court, why didn't you use the electoral branches to pass a bunch of laws or a constitutional amendment enshrining Roe? And the answer is you didn't have the support, nor can Congress even do this sort of thing. So now they're just attempting to lie to the American people and say that if you elect more Democrats, we will go back to status quo ante with regard to Roe. It ain't going to happen, guys. You're lying. But you got to seize on whatever you can if you got a doddering old president who's been a failure at everything he's tried. So here is President Biden on Friday saying they took away a constitutional right. Again, this is a lie. The constitutional right did not exist. Overruling a precedent does not mean that there was a right and then the right went away. It means that the right didn't exist in the first place and it was misinterpreted by the Supreme Court, which is exactly what the Supreme Court said. Today, the Supreme Court of the United States expressly took away a constitutional right from the American people that it had already recognized. They didn't limit it. They simply took it away. That's never been done to a right so important to so many Americans. But they did it. It's a sad day for the court and for the country. Okay, we can stop it right there for a second. So when he says it's never been, it's a right and it's never been done to so many Americans. So here's the thing. What you, do you mean that it was a constitutional right to have an abortion then it was taken away? And therefore it was moral, according to you. By that same logic, the logic that Joe Biden is using, slaveholders in the 1850s could have said, we had a constitutional right declared by Justice Taney and Dred Scott v. Sanford to property in human beings. And it was taken away by a war, not even by a constitutional amendment, because it took, the, it took the war to get to the constitutional amendment, not even by the Supreme Court. It was taken away by a quote unquote bloody invasion. And now no one thinks that. No one today believes that, nor should they. There was never a right in the United States to hold human beings in bondage. Because it was always wrong. It was evil and immoral. But according to Joe Biden, if the court had greenlit a thing and then it was taken away, that means it's bad. But he doesn't believe that. He doesn't believe that for one iota of one second. He's just mad that abortion went away as a federally protected category under Supreme Court jurisprudence that was a complete and deliberate misreading of the Constitution. He called this also a tragic error, by the way, a tragic error. Joe Biden, we want to talk about tragic errors. His entire presidency is a tragic error. Make no mistake. This decision is a culmination of a deliberate effort over decades to upset the balance of our law. It's a realization of an extreme ideology and a tragic error by the Supreme Court, in my view. The court has done what it has never done before, expressly take away a constitutional right that is so fundamental to so many Americans that it had already been recognized. Already been recognized. Again, my, my, the respect for precedent is suddenly shocking. From a legal perspective, I'm, I'm, they, they discovered precedent. You realize that until 2012, the precedent was that same-sex marriage was not the law of the land, and now it's the law of the land. So it's weird how suddenly some precedent is good and some precedent is bad. And there's no actual standard other than what Joe Biden and his adult brain thinks. And then he says, of course, that, again, it's an electoral play. This can't be the final word. Elect my friends in the Senate. They're not going to bleep. You know why they're not going to bleep? They don't have the power to do bleep. Here's Joe Biden. With this decision, the conservative majority of the Supreme Court shows how extreme it is, how far removed they are from the majority of this country. They made the United States an outlier among developed nations in the world. But this decision must not be the final word. My administration will use all of its appropriate lawful powers. But Congress must act. And with your vote, you can act. You can have the final word. This is not over. No, you're right. It's not. It's now going to go to the states, which is where it was before Roe. And but, but the point that he's making there, he makes one point there that I want to discuss a little bit more because people are just stupid and they don't understand things. And they deliberately misunderstand things. It's amazing. It's truly amazing. The amount of, of 
of self-discovery of ignorance on Twitter by folks is really an incredible thing. It is indeed amazing how so many people on the left, suddenly they become aware of like basic facts that we've known for years and years and years. Well, here's a basic fact that you should have known for years and years and years, especially if you listen to this program. You need life insurance. You just don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, you could be walking along the street and a bus is coming directly at you. But thankfully, just as that bus is coming at you, you step directly on a manhole cover, but the manhole cover is gone. And so the bus doesn't hit you. But unfortunately, inside the manhole, there is, in fact, a wave of sewage that washes you out to see where you're eaten by a shark. Well, as that entire process is happening, you might be thinking to yourself, man, I really should have listened to Shapiro and gone with Policy Genius. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find the insurance you need at the right price. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro to get started in minutes. You can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. The licensed agents of Policy Genius are on hand throughout the entire process to help you understand your options and make decisions with confidence. The Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies. They don't add on extra fees. Policy Genius won't sell your information to third parties, and they have thousands of five-star views across both Google and Trustpilot. Policy Genius has options that offer coverage in as little as a week. Avoid unnecessary medical exams. Since 2014, Policy Genius has helped over 30 million people shop for insurance and placed over $150 billion in coverage. So what exactly are you waiting for? Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro. Get your free life insurance quotes. See how much you could save. Already, folks, June has been the biggest month in Daily Wire's history. We still have a week to go. What is a Woman? Matt Walsh's documentary has a 97% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, over 5,000 ratings. The book What is a Woman is already a national bestseller. We had our premiere of the blockbuster of the summer, Terror on the Prairie, starring MMA fighter turned actress Gina Carano. We proved once and for all that Hollywood cannot cancel you if you don't let them. And now, this week on Wednesday, June 29th at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be backstage live at the Ryman. You'll see your favorite Daily Wire hosts like you've never seen them before, taking on the cultural and political topics of the day. Describing it doesn't really do it justice. Take a look. Welcome to the Daily Wire backstage live at the famous Ryman Auditorium. It was amazing. We were in the presence of greatness. The energy of having everyone on the same page was amazing. If your family member is still waiting for Fauci to give them permission to leave their house, it might be time to cut that off. (laughs) I'm actually pretty excited to meet all of them. I love everybody's opinion individually. I don't have a favorite. I like them all. If I had found out a way to make football players cry in high school. My high school experience would be a lot. <laughs> I'm just excited to be here and be surrounded by like-minded people and to just, you know, feel that energy. Who should we remove from office? Yeah, you One politician, the most powerful politician in the country. <laughs> Dr. Fauci. <laughs> Dr. Fauci, what are you talking about? We're doing culture here. I'm so thrilled to see this happening. If they say to half of the country, you can't, that half of the country needs to say, screw you, we will. Nashville on June 29th. Get your tickets now. It is the most fun event that we do all year. Join us for our biggest live event of the year. Hold on to the edge of your seats. You're not going to want to miss it. We have surprises in store. And I'm not talking about like Michael and Jeremy playing music or anything, like real surprises. Tune into Backstage Live at the Ryman this Wednesday, June 29th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Become a Daily Wire member by going to dailywire.com slash Ben. Use code Ben for 25% off your membership. That's dailywire.com slash Ben today. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So there you heard the president of the United States declare that the United States is now an outlier and so we need to elect Democrats so we won't be an outlier. This is a lie that's being re- reported by the media over and over. Eli Stokel's terrible staff writer for the LA Times. He says, President Biden and the leaders of the world's most powerful democracies convened in Germany on Sunday for the Group of Seven Summit displaying resolve and a bit of levity in maintaining their commitment to supporting Ukraine as they seek to address global economic woes, food shortages, and the needs of the developing world. However, however, the United States' position has now been undercut by the United States' by the Supreme Court's rollback of abortion rights. Back home, the Supreme Court's rollback of abortion rights on Friday continues to dominate the news, overshadowing Biden's high-stakes diplomacy, complicating his determination to carry democracy's torch on the world stage. So in other words, reverting, and this is an unbelievable line, reverting an issue back to state legislatures is complicating our role as a democracy on the world stage. The growing domestic unease, including pressure from progressives demanding Biden and Democrats fight harder to preserve abortion rights, only added to the doubts of the president's G7 counterparts about the stability of his presidency in American democracy more broadly. Um, I I have a question. So really, we're going to listen to the Europeans about this. Like we need and the Europeans immediately started putting out statements about how they are very, very upset about Roe versus Wade. So Prime Minister Boris Johnson of Britain, he called this a a big step backward. I need to hear from the Brits about this. Until I hear from Boris Johnson, I just, I'm not satisfied with what abortion policy is going to be in my home state of Florida. 
He said, I've always believed in a woman's right to choose. French President Emmanuel Macron expressed a similar sentiment on Twitter, calling abortion a fundamental right for all women. It must be protected, Macron wrote. I wish to express my solidarity with the women whose liberties are being undermined by the Supreme Court of the United States. Again, that's not what the Supreme Court does. That's not what the Supreme Court does. Okay, so we're hearing lectures from the Europeans. At this point, it might be worthy of thinking, uh, what is the abortion access like in Europe? And the answer is, the United States is a wild global outlier when it comes to actual abortion on planet Earth. So here is a map constructed by the Catholic News Agency. It is reflective of the law across Europe. And it shows when elective abortion is available, when elective abortion is available. And what it shows you is that actually there are a bunch of countries in Europe, including Poland, where elective abortion is available until week zero. There are also a bunch of countries in Europe in which elective abortion is available only until about week 10. And in fact, in places like France, elective abortion is available until week 15 in France. So we're hearing lectures about this. I noticed that the United States is well outside the mainstream of Europe. In fact, the only countries in Europe that are anywhere remotely close to the standards in the United States are Sweden and Iceland. That's it. The standard in Germany is 15 weeks. It is only allowed in cases of rape or if the, the health of the mother is considered at risk of serious harm, meaning like life of the mother. In places like Croatia, the answer is 10 weeks. In Poland, only in cases of rape or incest or risks mother's life. Elective abortions available until week zero. In the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, there's pretty significant restrictions on abortion there as well. In, in Ireland, significant restrictions. Again, the, the vast majority of countries in Europe have significantly more restrictions on abortion than the United States does. Meanwhile, up until Roe was, was just overruled, the abortion law in the United States was way more permissive. So again, this is a map that was provided by um, abortion law independent countries. And uh, here's what it shows. What it shows is that the legal limit is somewhere between 11 and 20 weeks for most of Europe, for almost all of Europe. In places, there are only a couple of places, as we mentioned, in which this is not true. Meanwhile, in the United States, the legal limit at somewhere between 21 and 30 weeks was almost all of the United States under Roe versus Wade. And then you had states where there was no legal limit. And that was places like Oregon. It's like Vermont. And there's a legal limit that, that just carries way the hell outside the mainstream. New York. So the, the, this bizarre notion that the United States is an outlier in terms of being strict on abortion is just a lie. It's not true. There will be states now that are outside the European mainstream. But guess what? Who cares? That's called America, where we have different states, just like Europe has different laws state by state in Europe. Who's truly extreme on abortion? I would venture to say that the people who are truly extreme on abortion are the people who are painting across their pregnant bellies. This is not yet a human. Or, for example, New York Attorney General Letitia James, who says that New York is now going to become Disneyland for abortion. You get to go there with your baby and come back without it. It's great. Drop your kids off for the rest of their lives. Here is, uh, here is Letitia James, the New York Attorney General. At this point in time, we are welcoming um, individuals who are seeking abortions to New York. New York has codified it in law, and this, uh, hopefully this week, um, as the legislative session re uh, returns, uh, they will codify it in our Constitution, the Equality Amendment, and I am confident that they will do just that. So go, go to New York for some abortion. Who's extreme here? We're going to pay for your abortion from another state with taxpayer dollars. You know, we have Stacey Abrams running for governor of Georgia. She's going to lose, as she should, saying there should be no limits on abortion. None. Zero. By the way, this is the Democratic Party platform stance. So when you hear that the Republican Party platform stance, which is abortion ban across the board, except in cases where the mother's life's in danger, when you hear that's out of the mainstream, understand that there are more people who believe in some laws restricting abortion, way more people than believe what Stacey Abrams and the Democratic Party platform is, which is abortion up until you're 95 years old. Here is, uh, here is Stacey Abrams making that case. Do you support any limitation on abortion or does it do you think that women should have the right to have an abortion all the way up to nine months? I believe an abortion is a medical decision. And I believe that that should be a choice made between a doctor and a woman and in consultation with her family. But I think the challenge that we have is that we keep putting this in a political space. This is a medical decision. And the medical choices that should be made should be governed by what is best for that woman and what is best at the 
suggestion of and advice of their doctor. Okay, the idea that this is a medical decision, no, it is not a medical decision because if it were, then you would care about, for example, you would ban abortion except when the life of the mother is in danger, for example, or except when, even if you're going to be more liberal, when there's serious risk to the health of the mother. But that's not what you're arguing for. That's not a medical decision. It's a moral decision. You think a woman should be able to arbitrarily decide when a life in her womb is actually worthy of life. That's what you actually think. This is the Democratic Party platform position. Abrams goes even further. So she is, it's amazing. For a woman who's considered such an unbelievably competent politician, she's wildly incompetent. So she was on CNN. This is just a couple of years after she made the big boo-boo of Georgia passed a voter law. And she encouraged the Major League Baseball to remove the All-Star game from Georgia. And then she had to walk that back because she realized, oh, wait a second, a bunch of people in Georgia will lose their jobs because of that. Now she's encouraging major corporations to leave the state of Georgia if Georgia passes laws protecting the unborn. This is an interesting way to run for governor of a state that you actually want to be in charge of. Disney and Netflix have expressed their opposition uh, to the so-called heartbeat abortion ban in Georgia when it was passed in 2019. Do you think those companies should pull their businesses from Georgia uh, when and if this uh, abortion restriction goes into effect? I would tell every single business and every single woman that they should do what is best for the women who work for them. They need to make certain that they are accommodating the very real health care challenges that will face women in the state of Georgia. They, they, they've got nothing. I mean, that, that's an unbelievable statement. She, she wants corporations to pull out of her home state. This, by the way, this will happen. Major U.S. companies, including Meta and J.P. Morgan Chase on Friday, said they'll cover travel costs for employees who seek legal abortions outside their home state after the Supreme Court released a ruling that overturned Roe versus Wade, according to ABC News. Several corporations in recent weeks, including Amazon and Starbucks, announced expanded health benefits to pay travel fees incurred by workers seeking an abortion if the procedure is unavailable near where they live. So they could deal with this by, you know, expanding parental benefits for their employees. Instead, they're going to pay for you to go and kill their baby. I mean, after all, you need to be back at work on Monday. J.P. Morgan Chase informed U.S. employees it will cover the cost of travel for those seeking an abortion who can't access the procedure legally in their home state. Meta, the parent company of Facebook, says it's going to offer similar coverage of travel expenses for employees seeking abortions. Tesla, Citigroup, Apple, Salesforce are among the additional companies that in recent weeks expanded abortion covers coverage for employees to include costs for travel when necessary. Lyft and Uber are also going to do the same. So if you thought that corporate America was lined up along, you know, business lines, I guess that you could argue that it's a business decision to have your pay for your employees to kill their babies. So they can be back at work on Monday. I, I suppose that that is a, a business line. But who's extreme? I would venture to say it's the people who are actively paying for abortions. That's probably the people who are extreme. Or maybe the people who are encouraging their own, their own home state to be boycotted so you can have abortion on demand. And so the Democrats have no answer to this. I mean, you, you, you have Democrats who are attempting to cope. Nancy Pelosi, of course, was very upset. She's a very good Catholic, Nancy Pelosi. When I say she's a very good Catholic, I mean she's a horrible Catholic. The way that I know she's a horrible Catholic is because she stumps for abortion on demand. This definitionally makes you a bad Catholic. In the same way that if you are a, an Orthodox Jew or a Jew at all, and you stump every day for violating the Sabbath, it's not just something you do. It's an act of good. We need, we need more Sabbath violation. This would make you a bad Jew. Okay, because these are religions with doctrines. Catholicism has doctrines. One of those doctrines is that you're supposed to protect the life of the unborn. I can safely say as a non-Catholic that all I have to do is compare the doctrines to what Nancy Pelosi is saying to notice that what she's doing on this issue is bad Catholicism. So here is Nancy Pelosi mourning, mourning, just in abject mourning for abortion. Supreme Court has ended a constitutional right. This is 50 years proclaimed a constitutional right. What happened today was historic in many respects. Historic in that uh, it had not granted, recognized a constitutional right and then reversed it. This is a first. It, it, is, it is not, in fact, a first. It is the end of an era in which the Supreme Court delegated to itself the power to determine what human life constitutes and why you should be allowed to kill it whenever Harry Blackman thinks you should. And Nancy Pelosi then suggests, oh, they achieved their dark, extreme end. It's dark. It's dark to save babies. It's bad. It's bad. You know what? You know what? It, the essence of light is um, sexual fluidity, promiscuity, gender, gender time story hour with five-year-olds and killing the unborn. That's, that's, that's where light really is. That's where the light resides, according to Nancy Pelosi. Today, the Republican-controlled Supreme Court has achieved their dark, extreme goal of ripping away a woman's right to make 
their own reproductive health decisions. Because of Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, and the Republican Party, their supermajority in the Supreme Court, American women today have less freedom than their mothers. So, I, by the way, I would like to notice here that um, the language about pregnant men has gone away, hasn't it? We're, we're talking about women again. So that's exciting. Congrats to all the trans people who, um, who have now been ignored by the Democratic Party. That's, that's exciting stuff. Women today have less freedom than their mothers. To do what? The definition of freedom, according to the left, is basically to do whatever you want without consequence to any other human being, which uh, is not actually the definition of freedom or liberty, is the definition of libertinism and sin. But this is, uh, this is what the left is into. Kamala Harris, for her part, uh, she tweeted out that um, a picture of herself, because this is what our best politicians do, looking at the TV, deeply effective politician Kamala Harris, a picture of her watching CNN from Air Force Two. I know there are women out there who are afraid. To those of you who feel alone and scared, I want you to know the president and I are fighting for you and your rights. We're in this fight together. By in this fight together, she means that she's 30,000 feet off the ground watching CNN. So um, applause for, for Kamala Harris. Meanwhile, you've got Elizabeth Warren talking about how the Supreme Court burned its legitimacy. Elizabeth Warren, who, uh, who tried to create an entire new branch of government in the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau unconstitutionally, is going to tell you about the Constitution. But I do know this, that the Republicans have been very overt about trying to get people through the court who didn't have a published record on Roe, but who they knew, wink, wink, nod, nod, were going to be extremists on the issue of Roe versus Wade. And that is exactly what we have ended up with. This court has lost legitimacy. They have burned whatever legitimacy they may still have had after their gun decision, after their voting decision, after their union decision. They just took the last of it and set a torch to it with the Roe versus Wade opinion. I believe we need to get some confidence back in our court. And that means we need more justices on the United States Supreme Court. So she's calling for packing the court. So now we get into the actual solutions that are being provided by the Democrats. You have the outsized outrage and the crazy towns. But now we get to their actual solutions. So what exactly are they suggesting? All the solutions that they're suggesting are completely impractical. They're not realistic. They're crazy. So David Plouffe, Plouffe over at uh, the Pod Save America crew. Uh, this is the, the dunce who suggested on uh, MSNBC that the Daily Wire should actively be bottle, uh, should be throttled and bottlenecked by Facebook because we exist. So he, he's a wonder, he, he's, when it comes to rights, he's a wonderful person. He, uh, he tweeted out, the messaging needs to be clear, consistent, and true. Congress can override what the Supreme Court did and pass a law to legalize abortion. They cannot. To do that, we need to elect two more Democratic senators and to hold the House. President Biden will sign a law codifying Roe if that happens. Uh, that is untrue. That law will immediately be struck down by the Supreme Court as it should be. You know who writes that? Ian Milheiser, the moron over at Vox knows that. He talks about how the Women's Health Protection Act, which he's very much in favor of, there is no constitutional basis for it. It would get struck down almost immediately. Because the fact is that the same court, like this is the thing that the left, when they, when they talk about the current constituency of the Supreme Court, they talk about those, those conservative justices, the textualist judges. Those same conservative justices are not going to vote in favor of the federalization of the abortion issue because those justices are in favor of delegation of power and they are in favor of the balance between the federal government and the state government. In other words, the same justices who you say are religious bigots who are seeking to ram down their pro-life positions, one, did not declare a right to life implicit in the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, two, did not rule out a bound substantive due process, as Clarence Thomas even suggested that they should, and three, is not going to allow for an expansion of federal power. They're going to curtail federal power. That's what they've been doing. They've been reducing federal power because federal power has been arrogated to itself at the expense of the state. So those horrible, evil Supreme Court justices who are just Republican legislators in drag. That's not what they do. The high likelihood, I would say almost certainty, is that if a pro-life law passed that banned abortion nationwide, just via Congress, not via constitutional amendment, it would be struck down by the Supreme Court of the United States on federalist grounds. And if a pro-choice law passed that did the same thing, it would be struck down by the United States Supreme Court on federalist grounds. Congress can't simply declare a right to abortion and then use it to cram down various abortion policies on states, it doesn't have the power to do that. You require a constitutional amendment to create a law that is now off limits by the state. You can't just arrogate that power even to commerce. I mean, to, to Congress. 
Again, Congress's power, largely in terms of what states can do, derives from basically the Necessary and Proper Clause and the Commerce Clause. There is no case that the Necessary and Proper Clause covers abortion law, and the Commerce Clause did not cover abortion law. In fact, it's perfectly clear, just, just as Kavanaugh wrote a concurrence basically saying this, his concurrence says that when it comes to interstate trafficking, you can't have a state that regulates another state in their abortion law or prevents people from leaving that state in order to go somewhere else for an abortion. He said that in the concurrence. And yet here you have the Democrats saying, oh, we'll pass an abortion law nationally. No, you won't. No, you 100% will not. Because I promise you that the Supreme Court is not going to be allowing for, for that sort of thing. This is going to be done at the state level. So David Plouffe is lying. Democrats are lying to you when they say they're going to codify this at a national. First of all, let's see you try to codify abortion up to a point of birth at a national level. See how that goes for you electorally. If you think that's a winner, really try it. But two, practically speaking, it ain't going to happen. Meanwhile, you have the even more insane people like AOC out there saying, maybe we'll impeach the justices. Oh, will you? Really? Mm-hmm. Let's say, what, what's the logic behind that? We'll have the irrepressibly moronic Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez speak on behalf of the American people. Do you think lying in a confirmation a, hearing is an impeachable offense? I believe so. Okay. I believe so. I believe lying under oath is an impeachable offense. Um, I believe that violating federal law in not disclosing income from political organizations, as Clarence Thomas uh, mm -hmm. did years ago, is also potentially an impeachable offense. So they're going to impeach the justices they don't like based on the fact that those justices did not say they would overrule Roe versus Wade in their hearings. OK, I, then, then we get to go back and we get to find out, like, you know, Ketanji Brown Jackson, the new justice. She would not answer what a woman was. So if later on she declares that a woman is a man, do we get to impeach her? The answer is no. It, this is this is irredeemably stupid. But again, could have that pasted on every AOC bumper sticker. And then she, she goes where she really wants to go. OK, Democrats. When they talk about insurrections and burning down institutions and the right wrecking all of the democratic institutions of our society, understand they don't give two craps about these institutions. They hate any institution that prevents them from doing precisely what they want. They don't care about balance of powers. You'll have the Supreme Court dominated by Republican appointed justices who will say to pro-lifers at the federal level, you can't regulate this because this is a state's issue. You'll never see that from the Democrats ever. They don't care. It's all power. It's all Michel Foucault power all the way down. Everything they do. So here is AOC saying these institutions were built on creaky foundations, and now it's time to tear them down. A lot of these institutions were built on, on, a, on a very creaky foundation. And so what that means is that when we build it back, we need to build it back stronger than what it was before. We need to build it back stronger than what it was before by, by destroying the institution. So what exactly is she suggesting? She's saying we need to pack the court, she said past presidents from Lincoln to FDR understood the dangerous stakes of allowing an unchecked court overreach its authority and threaten our democracy, threaten our democracy. Lincoln ignored the court. To, I, threatening our democracy is now letting people vote on an issue. Did you know that? Interesting. I mean, normally, I would think it threatens the democracy when you have an oligarchy seizing issues and removing it from the purview of the people. But apparently it's a threat to the democracy to allow people to vote on things. Interesting logic there or illogic. She says the ruling is Roe, but the crisis is democracy. Leaders must share specific plans for both. The president and dem leaders can no longer get away with familiar tactics of committees and studies to avoid tackling our crises head on anymore. So what should we do? We should restrain judicial review, open clinics on federal lands. So she, she actually wants the federal government to now um, to now promote with your taxpayer dollars abortion because states can't crack down on the federal government's practice of abortion. Yeah, good luck with Joe Manchin on that one, lady. Court expansion, expand Fed access and awareness of pills and abortions. So. We, we should have you federally subsidized sending RU486 to people in the mail. She says we need to add seats. Dem leaders must tell voters the plan. What's the actual need? What specific seats are we focused on? And what's the return? What is Biden Congress actually willing and able to do with 52 or 60 seats? Be honest. Details motivate. At least they're saying the quiet part out loud. Stacey Abrams is doing the same thing. She says it's time to pack the courts and kill the filibuster. Here is your perspective. Well, the, the, the sitting governor of Georgia, as we all know. And, and a deeply important, she's the president of Earth, according to Star Trek. That's how deeply important Stacey Abrams is, this loon. Here we go. There are a lot of progressives, as you, as you know, who are calling on President Biden to expand the size of the Supreme Court. Do you think Biden should do that? I know how the law works, and it is not up to President Biden. This is a choice that has to be made by our 
both executive and legislative branch, but I do think that we have to recognize that there's nothing sacrosanct about nine members in the United States Supreme Court, but that is a long-term question. What we have to focus on right now is the danger that this Dobbs decision presents to women in the state of Georgia and across the country. Well, in more short, ter short term, do you think that the Senate should eliminate the filibuster to codify Roe versus Wade into law? Would you support that? I would support lifting it for Roe v. Wade. I would support lifting it for voting rights. These are constitutional issues. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, no filibuster. Pack the courts. These people love institutions. They're real. They're, they're that lady who who suggests that uh, the election was stolen from her in 2018 in Georgia. Lo they, they love institutions. By the way, Joe Biden, for his part, he says he's not going to pack the court. So, uh, good luck with with that one for the Democrats, which has led, of course. To Democrats now speculating about how can we shove Joe Biden's body outside of this car? Can we throw mom off the back of the train here? So we have um, a piece from the electoral analyst John Ellis saying that Hillary Clinton should return. <laughs> the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade creates the opening for Hillary Clinton to get out of stealth mode and start down the path toward declaring her candidacy for the 2024 presidential nomination. Conditions are favorable after all. Hillary Clinton is younger than Joe Biden. Okay, just, just to note right now, Hillary Clinton's age. Hillary Clinton is um, all of 74 years young. So she would be 76. Wow, you're really going, going, um, going to the youth movement in the Democratic Party. So they're, they're thinking about Hillary Clinton. They're thinking about Gavin Newsom, that androgynous Ken doll of a human being who's the governor of California. As his wife stood behind him and held back tears, Governor Gavin Newsom on Friday called for the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. He called it sickening and beckoned women in other states to California, their sanctuary for free abortion care. Fine, do it. Like, good luck to you. The, the, California, you're going to run on the, on the sanctuary abortion state. So illegal immigration and abortion, welcome in the state of California. Businesses that earn money, not so welcome in the state of California. They don't have solutions for any of this stuff because, again, the idea from the Democratic Party is that they're just going to yell and scream about all of this. And then they're just going to try to scare you. And the way that they're going to scare you is by suggesting that you are going to need an abortion, even if you're not. Or they're going to suggest that if you're in New York or California, that you are in danger of losing your abortions, which you are not. Or they're going to claim that there's going to be a lot that comes next. And this is one of my favorite arguments that the left is making right now. They, they continue to maintain that it's really not about abortion. And the reason they keep saying it's not about, it's about other things. It's not about abortion. The reason they keep saying it's not about abortion is because if it is about abortion, they lose the argument. Because again, their arguments on behalf of abortion are really quite ugly. And- all that stuff ends up in the state level anyway. So instead, they say it's about other things. It's about everything else. So for example, you have Kamala Harris suggesting that interracial marriage is now in jeopardy. Really, Kamala Harris? Truly? You think Loving versus Virginia, which is not predicated on substantive due process grounds. It's based on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, you moron. That this is, that it's now, again, they have to expand this out. Oh, they're going to take away same-sex marriage. They're going to reverse on interracial marriage. They're going to, they're going to, oh my God. They're going to take away your contraception. Or maybe they're not going to do any of those things. And they explicitly say that in the decision. But again, if you, if you don't have the argument with you, then you lie. So here's Kamala Harris lying poorly, which is what she does for a living. In holding that, it is not deeply rooted in our history. Today's decision on that theory, then, calls into question other rights that we thought were settled such as the right to use birth control, the right to same-sex marriage, the right to interracial marriage. God, she is a garbage politician. They constructed the worst politician in the world in Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. They're like, what if we took the insincerity of Hillary Clinton and we combined it with the inability to, to speak with any level of enthusiasm of Al Gore? And what if we combined that with the smarminess of like late stage John Stewart, if we combined all of those things into one human being, but she's intersectional. So, you know, that makes it all better. The New York Times, by the way, trying the same sort of thing. The court is not going to stop at abortion. If you think that's hyperbole, consider Justice Clarence Thomas's concurring opinion in Dobbs, in which he called for the court to reconsider other constitutional rights that Americans have enjoyed in some cases for a decade, including the right to use birth control, the right to marry the person of their choosing, and the right of consenting adults to do as they please in the privacy of their bedrooms. These rights share a similar constitutional grounding to the now former right to abortion. Listen, I wish that the court re did reconsider these decisions on the grounds that the court has no business in these areas. 
And I'm in favor of contraceptives being widely available, for example. So um, first of all, it's not what a court does. When a court says we are not involving ourselves in a decision, it doesn't mean that you now can't do the thing that the court is talking about. The, the, the willful ignorance, the, the dramatic willful ignorance of these folks is really astonishing, but they don't have the votes for this. Thomas is the only one who said anything remotely like this, but they have to keep making the case that the next thing to go is going to be gay marriage. The next thing to go is contraception. No, it actually is not. No, it's not. To my great consternation, Obergfell is not going to be overturned. To my great consternation, Griswold is not going to be overturned. I'm in favor of bad decisions being overturned, but they don't have the votes to do it. But the Democrats have to try and scare people because they're hoping that if they scare people, then eventually the, the freaking people out will lead to people voting for them. It's not going to. And you know what else is not going to lead to people voting for them? The fact that they can't control, that they always go too far, always. The, the, this is why you have Maxine Waters out there doing what she always does. Has Maxine Waters ever seen a riot she doesn't like? So Maxine Waters says, we're going to defy them. And then, um, and um, yeah, it's great. Maxine Waters, most corrupt member of Congress. The hell with the Supreme Court. We will defy them. Women will be in control of their bodies. And if they think black women are intimidated or afraid, they got another thought coming. Black women will be out in droves. We will be out by the thousands. We will be out by the millions. We're going to make sure we fight for the right to control our own bodies. Remember that time where it was insurrection to say this sort of stuff and then it results in violence? Uh, well, uh, rioters showed up at the Arizona State Senate over the weekend and uh, they were they were attacking the building. Seems kind of insurrection -y. There they are outside the doors and they are um, they're beating on the doors. In L.A., a man set a police officer on fire with a makeshift flamethrower during Friday night's abortion rights demonstration in downtown Los Angeles. So uh, here is some of the footage from Los Angeles. And they, they, these folks, they're all in fa You know what? They're, they're just peaceful, again, mostly peaceful protests happening. It's good, good exciting stuff. Holy shit. There's the man trying to uh, set a police officer on fire. So that's that's all good stuff. You know, they just wonderful, gentle people. Meanwhile, another Colorado pregnancy center was uh, was vandalized. It was set ablaze. This would make, what, the 17th or 18th since uh, the original leak of the Supreme Court decision. So, yeah, bottom line is this. The Democrats have no way of coping with this. They don't have any plan to deal with this. And um, everything they're telling you is a lie designed for electoral gain. But those lies, I think, are very unlikely to pay off for them. Instead, what you're going to have is where this should have been back in 1970 which is a reversion back to the states where these issues will be played out. All right, we'll be back here later today with an additional hour of content. In the meantime, go check out one of our newest podcasts, Morning Wire. On today's episode, they report more on the fallout from Roe versus Wade. That episode is available right now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure to tune in. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Bradford Carrington, executive producer Jeremy Boring, supervising producer Mathis Glover, production manager Pavel Wydowski, associate producer Savannah Dominguez Morris, editor Adam Saievitz, audio mixer Mike Coromina, hair and makeup artist and wardrobe Fabiola Cristina, production coordinator Jessica Kranz. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. John Bickley here, Daily Wire editor in chief. Wake up every morning with our show, Morning Wire where we bring you all the news that you need to know in 15 minutes or less. Join me and my co-host, Georgia Howe, for daily coverage of all the biggest stories on Morning Wire. 